that song, His goodness and mercy are running after me, chasing us down. All my life, God has been faithful. Uh, you testify to that this morning. He's a faithful God. And I love that. I think about uh, Jacob and Israel on his deathbed. He said something similar. He says, all my life to this day, God has shepherded me faithfully. And I, I guess I'm old enough to be able to say that uh, in, in looking back over my years, God has been faithful. I'm glad to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Amen. It's a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord. And we're going to dive into his word in the gospel of Luke this morning. And I am concluding today the series that I have been on uh, with uh, the end times calling this people get ready. Turn to your neighbor and say people get ready. And so we're going to look at Luke here, and I'm going to bring this to a close. Um, so I'm going to talk about the expression, I do business until he comes. Your King James Version or other versions may say occupy until he comes. And I'll be looking at Luke chapter 19 and verse 11 through 13. Here's what the word says. Now, as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Therefore, he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And so he called Ten of his servants and delivered to them ten minas and said to them, do business until I come. Can you say amen to the reading of his word? Now, stay there in that chapter because I'm going to come back to it because we can't just leave us hanging here at verse 13. Now, I, I've spent the whole summer speaking about the end times and the return of the Lord. And really, church, I've only scratched the surface. But this is not meant and hasn't been meant to be an end-time prophecy seminar. In fact, I mentioned in the beginning that I refuse to get caught up in debates about times and seasons or making predictions beyond what the Scripture plainly reveals in the Word. And when it comes to the end times, there are some core things that Every believer ought to be alert about. And I've tried to deliver some of those that I felt were core. I chose to do this over the summer because often over the summer, people travel like many are this morning. And people get spiritually relaxed and, and off focused and maybe distracted from the goal. And so my goal this summer has been to remind the church that it's time to get ready. And I, I think about what Romans 13 and 11, Paul said this. Do this knowing the time and now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than we first believed. In other words, he's saying, let's wake up and get ready. Jesus spoke much about the end times and his return. And he repeatedly gave us the mandate, watch and be ready. Can you say that out loud with me? Watch and be ready. Watch, because you don't know the day when he will come. Watch, because you don't want that day to come as a thief in the night. Watch, because you don't want your lamp burning out of oil. Watch, because you don't know the hour when the bridegroom is coming. Watch, because scoffers are coming in the last days, questioning the promise of his return. What watch and be ready for no man knows the day or the hour, not the angels of heaven, only the Father in heaven. Everybody shout watch this morning. 
Watching involves understanding the signs and the seasons. And that is why I preached what I have preached. Here's what we have learned in summary. We've learned that in the last days, perilous times will come. Men will not endure sound doctrine. The love of many will grow cold. Men will become lovers of self and haters of good. We also learned about the spirit of the Antichrist, the spirit of lawlessness that's already at work. We learned about Christians in the church will be hated and, and for a time fiercely persecuted, some even beheaded for their faith. We also learned about the beast, the Antichrist, and his false prophet, and the number of his name, 666, who will rise to power under demonic influence. We also learned about the blessed hope that somewhere in the midst of all this chaos, the Lord himself will appear in the clouds and a shout will go forth and a trumpet's going to sound and the dead in Christ will rise from the grave. And those that are alive at that time will be raptured, caught up to be with Jesus in the air. And we'll be transformed, changed into his likeness. And we learned about this blessed hope. We learned also last week, or I believe it was, that those left behind on earth after this resurrection rapture will be will endure seven seals of judgment followed by seven bowls of wrath being poured upon mankind. And I just emphasized it last week. And I want to emphasize it again this morning. You don't want to be left behind in the resurrection rapture of the church. Did you hear me this morning, church? You don't want to be left behind. We learned last week that we can expect the glorious triumph and the reign of Jesus Christ. And we, the saints of God, reigning with him on earth over the nations, Revelation says, for a thousand years. I don't know about you guys. I want to be in that number. I want to answer when the shout comes and he calls me. If I die before then, I want to hear the trumpet call me out of the grave. If I die today, I want to know that I'm marked. I belong to him. My name's in the Lamb's book of life that I've been born again. I want to be ready. Are you born again this morning? Are you ready if Jesus came back today? If you were to die today, if Jesus was to make the shout to call the church home today, would you be ready? And I have a question today to the church. After all that I preached about the end times, now that we know and we're clear that we're in the last days and Jesus is coming back again, I ask this question, what now? What does that mean to us? What do we do with this information? We know he's coming back. We know these are the end times. We know that heavy stuff is going to go down. What now? What should be our approach? Well, first of all, there's the basics. It's obvious, and that is we need to be ready by being born again. If you're not born again in the house, make sure you are before you leave this Sunday service. We have to be ready by living the sanctified life, chasing after holiness, being baptized with the Holy Spirit and living the spirit filled life and also following peace with all men and living in right relationships with everybody. Is that all right this morning? And in a nutshell, what we need to be doing is get right and get on fire for the Lord. Let's get on mission and start living on purpose. Did y'all hear that this morning? Let's get on mission and start living on purpose. So, so what does that mean? What do we do if we know we're in the end times? What does the church do? Do we hunker down? Do we become conspiracy theorists and start stockpiling supplies? Do we go into a hold down the fort mentality? Uh, there was a hymn back in the day we used to sing in the church I got saved in called Hold the Fort for I Am Coming. Anybody know that hymn? I, I, we used to sing it, but after a while it started bothering me because of the, the mentality behind it. 
of the church kind of just hanging on, holding down the fort, surrounded by the enemy and waiting for Jesus to come. And I didn't like this mentality because holding down the fort was never the command of the Lord for the church. Rather, it was go forth and go into every nation and take turf and take dominion and infiltrate the camp of the enemy. Come on, somebody. We're not here to hold down the fort. And so, so the language of the New Testament shows a far different approach. That's why I like and we like Ephesians chapter 6 and 10 through 13. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Everybody say that out loud. Be strong in the Lord. And in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the enemy. For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, or against, but against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this age. Against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, because of this, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having, having done all to stand. That's why he said in 1 Corinthians 15 and 58, Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Y'all hear that language? That's why he said in 1 Corinthians 16 and 13, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Somebody shout again, be strong. He's not talking to a bunch of wimps here. He's not talking about to some people tiptoeing through the tulip, panty-waisted, limp-wristed, backbone spineless. Uh, he's talking to somebody who's putting on the armor, brave, strong, steadfast, and filled with the Spirit, ready to take a stand. We're not to be a timid, fearful church because the days are evil. We're not to be a people with a victim mentality, always offended, carrying our feelings on our shoulders. We're not weak in light of the threats of this world and culture. And guess what? Our mission is not determined by the dictates of the current events of the world, nor by the popular culture. Our mission has not change. Jesus gave us the mandate, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every nation, make disciples, be witnesses unto me. Where? Do this in every nation, do this in every generation, and do this until I come back. If we're going to be the generation that ushers in the return of the Lord, I want to make sure I'm on mission. Y'all with me this morning, church? So let's look at this parable because the parable Jesus gives is about his going away and his return. He gives a similar parable in Matthew 25, which I like better, but I'm using this one today for a specific reason. Because frankly, this parable is about he going away and returning, but it's more about what happens in between. And that's where we are. This parable is about what happens in between the, the Lord leaving and coming back to retrieve. And so it's important to us to pay attention. Now, now look at verse 12. If you're there, let's see what he says. Now, the master goes away. He, he called 10 to, well, let's, let's just read it and I'll break it down. Therefore, he said, a servant, certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then to return. So he called 10 of his servants, delivered them 10 minas, and said to them, do business until I come. Y'all ready to take some notes here? The nobleman represents Jesus, who will go away until he receives his kingdom. And at the set time, he's coming back. He's returning. Everybody with me? Now, now he calls together his servants. Now, I'll tell you that these servants represent the church. He called together 10 of his servants. Everyone say 10. 
That's significant. Jesus doesn't just make up a story with random numbers. He's very specific in his teaching, and he uses the number 10. He's going away. He calls 10 servants together. He gives each of them uh, uh, minas, 10 minas, and says, do business until I return. Now, let me tell you about the number 10. The number 10 in the Bible is used 242 times in the pages of the book. The designated the designation tent is used 79 times. 10 is also viewed as a complete and perfect number. It is made up of four which is a uh, four which represents physical creation and six which symbolizes man. It's also made up of the number 7 and the number 3 which both represent God. The meaning of 10 is one of testimony, law, and responsibility and the completeness of order. In Genesis chapter 1, the phrase God said happens 10 times and then God gives man these 10 commandments and the 10 commandments represents man's responsibility to obey the command a tithe is a tenth of our earnings and it's a testimony of our faith in the Lord. The Passover lamb was presented on the 10th day of the month of Nisan, as was Jesus at his crucifixion. And so 10 represents responsibility to God. So Jesus doesn't just randomly choose a number in this parable. He calls 10 servants, which represent the wholeness of the church. Y'all with me? Now, let me just throw this extra in. Every, in, in Israel's day, at the time of Christ, every village, city, and town had a synagogue. Besides the temple in Jerusalem, a synagogue was able to be constructed when you compiled 10 elders. If you had 10 elders, you were able to form a synagogue, a congregation. And so Jesus using 10 here in the Jewish mind was very clear. It represented the congregation. And so here we see the ten servants representing the church. And so what he's saying is the master's about to go away. He calls the servants, the wholeness of the church to him. And the church being left behind with responsibility of what belongs to the Lord. Y'all with me guys? Now he gives them each how many minas? Ten. That's significant. And so, so each of them were, were giving a, a ten minas. So, so each of these represents individual responsibility. So here's what we have. We have collective responsibility, the church. And then you have individual responsibility. Each person was given ten minas. So we have collective responsibility and individual responsibility. So what was a mina? Amina was about three months wages. So each person was given about three months wages. Now, we often talk about God being a God of more than enough, right? Well, this is an example. He releases into their hands enough for right now and enough for into the future more than enough. So the mandate then is given do business until I come. Now, church, this is beautiful and it's a powerful truth because this is what Jesus is giving an example. This is before his ascension. He hands us the responsibility as the church and he hands us responsibility as individuals. And the mandate is do business until he comes back again. What business? Kingdom business, taking care of what belongs to the master. We as a church have a mission and that and we as individuals have a mission. We as a church have a purpose and we as individuals have a purpose. And that includes the church universal 
Talking about the church throughout the world, whatever branch it may be. Church of God, Assembly of God, Baptist, Mennonite, whatever. All the branches of the church of God, universal. And it also includes the local church, every local church congregation. And it includes all who are born again as individuals. Are y'all with me, guys? He gives them ten minas. And says, do something with this. Increase it. Multiply it. Be fruitful with it. Now, there is a principle. If you come on Wednesday nights, you kind of start learning these. But there's a principle in scriptural interpretation that we follow. And it's this. Scripture interprets scripture. So when we ask ourselves what business we ought to be occupied with. First of all, we look at the parable. It speaks for itself. Look at verse 13 or verse 15. Let me read this to you. Pay Pay attention and follow along. And so it was that when he returned, that's the return of the Lord, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money, the church, to be called to him that he might know how every man had gained by trading. That's the individual. One came and said, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. He took what God had given him and he doubled it. Y'all got that? Verse 17, another comes and says, well, he says in verse 17, well done, good servant, because you were faithful in very little and have authority now over 10 cities. The second comes and says, master, your mina has earned five minas. He made increase, not as high, but he still increased. Likewise, he said to him, you also will be over five cities. Now, can I stop and pause? It's not in my notes, but I just want to add this in here. There's two principles that we learn here, and we got to kind of just get over it and learn how to apply it in our lives. The first principles is the law of promotion in the kingdom of God. Did y'all hear me? It's the law of promotion in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, it's not who you buy. It's not who you rub elbows with. It's not who your mama is. It's not who you uh, uh, rub palms with. It's not who you climb up the ladder. In the kingdom of God, God promotes people when they are faithful with the little. They will be trusted with more. It's very simple. It's very simple. If you have a church with 10 people, but you faithfully preach and you faithfully pastor and you faithfully love and you faithfully uh, pray for, God's going to trust you with more. If you are operating a ministry budget of a, of a thousand dollars and that and you're doing it faithfully, you're being a good steward and you're managing well and using a budget and paying your tithes, then God's going to trust you with a hundred thousand. If God has you over a children's ministry and you only have three, but you give everything you have and you're loving them and you're preparing like you have 300 and you are, are faithfully pastoring and praying over them. Then God says, I could trust you with the three. Now I'm going to trust you with the 30. Are y'all with me, guys? It's not that hard. It's the law of spiritual promotion. The second thing that we see here is, is the, um, uh, the fact that one had a double increase and the other 25% increase. What does that mean? We're not going to all produce the same. That's why you don't need to worry about looking over what someone else has or what someone else is doing. Looking at the church down the road running a thousand and we're running 50. Or looking at the pastor who has this great choir and we're trying to scramble with five people. And we're saying we're trying to make comparisons. And, oh, if I just had that crowd or I had that choir or if I just had that leader. Not everybody's going to increase the same. He's not looking for a certain measure. In fact, the only person we need to compare ourselves to in the kingdom is ourselves. Am I producing with what I have? Did I start off with one, but now I have two? Did I start off with five, but now I have ten? God wants us to increase, and we don't worry about what other people are increasing. Each increases according to his anointing and his ability. Y'all with me? That's why sometimes it's really kind of ridiculous in the States, at least, when a church is turning into a mega church and you watch these younger pastors, they start trying to dress like the pastor of the mega church, trying to do the sermon style of that pastor in the mega church. 
They start trying to do the order of service like the pastor in the mega church, thinking if I do one, two, three, my church of 50 is going to be like, no, you, that, you're looking at the superficial. That's not the, that, that's not the law of increase in the kingdom. God's looking for you to be faithful with what you have. And what you have is not what he has. And where you are is not where he's at. And your field is not their field. Every harvest field is different. Every atmosphere is different. The demons he has to fight with are not the demons you have to fight with. And, and what he had to pay, it may not be what you have to pay. And so we need to stop worrying about what other people are doing in that advancing and say, okay, God, what I have with me and what I have in my hand, let me be faithful. Let me do well. Let me increase. Let me reproduce. Because he's looking for uh, those who are faithful. He's not going to come back and say, well done, you talented singer. Well done, you dynamic preacher. Well done, you tithe giver. Well, he's going to come back and say, well done, you good and faithful servant. Be faithful in what you have. Is that all right? It's there. Now listen, that wasn't in my notes. So hopefully I, I, I didn't break that down. What's he looking for, church? Look here. Reproduction. They want to say reproduction. reproduction. Adding to the kingdom. Increase and growth. Investment that brings profit. God expects his church to be fruitful. God expects churches to be productive. And to be sure, God also holds individual congregations accountable for their reproduction and fruitfulness. Now, if you want to turn there, you can in Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3. But this can be seen so clear that God pays attention to the local congregation. He knows the local congregation. He knows city mission. We're a local congregation, and we're not the only one on the block. But I believe that when you belong to him, he knows you. But Revelation chapters 1, 2, and 3 is very clear. Jesus has John write letters to seven church congregations in Asia Minor. They were local congregations. And what I love about this is that each church congregation was addressed by Jesus himself. Now, that's pretty powerful, but there's something even deeper. Each local church congregation has a candlestick representing them in the throne room of God. Wow. And then the third thing is each local congregation was known intimately by Jesus. He says, I know you. I know where you're at. I know your works. I know what you've been through. I know you, local church. God, listen, guys, this is just a powerful thing because, because it lets us know how, how, how important the local church is to Christ. So, so Jesus gives a report to each one of those churches. He says, look, I know you. I know you're doing this well, but I also know you need to fix this. Right? And then, and then each of the churches is encouraged. Afterwards, he says, all right, guys. He goes, but this is what I want you to do. I want you to get things right so that you can endure until the end. Because there is a promise and there's a reward for those who finish this race. Each local congregation. Now, pay attention. If you look in Revelations 1, 2, and 3, that it's Jesus sending these letters to each church. Wouldn't it be amazing if he just wrote us a letter? Come on, Lord, city mission. I, I know you, your candlesticks in my presence, your, your pastor, I know him too. And this is what you're doing well. Keep it up. Good work. This is what you need to fix. Come on, let's get it right. I want to hear from the Lord like that. But get this. Jesus sends letters to each local church and he addresses each letter to the pastor. Now, he calls each pastor the angel, but it's not like angelic beings in heaven angel. It's the Greek word for uh, messenger. And so it's literally your Bible should read to the messenger of the church of Ephesus, the messenger of the church of Thyatira, the messenger of the church of Sardis. And the messenger was the local pastor. Now, as a pastor, sometimes when I'm feeling discouraged or feeling overburdened, I remind myself of this, that that Jesus said that I the, Jesus is shown with stars in his hand. He said, these stars 
They're the pastors. I'm holding them in my hand. And every time I read that, I say, Lord, keep me in your hands. Because that's a beautiful image. So he has the pastors in his hand, the candlesticks representing the local congregation in the throne room. And he has this intimate knowledge of each congregation. And he's giving them the evaluation. But he does it through the messenger who is the pastor. Wow. Each local church is held responsible, and each local pastor is held responsible. I want to pay attention to this note. How vital, how important is the local church congregation that the local congregation has a candlestick in the throne room of God. It is the presence. It is light. It is nearness. It is intimacy. It is recognition by God of who we are. I'm here to tell you, I believe that God knows city mission. He recognizes us and he keeps us near and he wants us to fulfill our mission and get ourselves right so that we can do it well. Look what he says in Revelation 1 and 20. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars of the angels are messengers of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Now notice he didn't write the letters to the deacons of the church. He didn't write the letters to the church mamas. He didn't write the letters to the highest tithe paying member of the church. He addressed each pastor, the messenger. These seven local congregations are addressed because they're about to be the first to receive the book of Revelation concerning the end times and the return of the Lord. And so as custodians of this, they needed to get themselves together. In essence, Jesus is saying, you churches need to get yourself together, get right, because the Lord is coming back and we're all going to have to give an account and answer for ourselves. We have a responsibility as a local church under the messenger or pastor, and we must be fulfilling that mission until Jesus comes back. When you read the letters to these seven churches, it's a good glimpse to what pleases the Lord and what doesn't please the Lord. I mean, it's kind of plain. I don't have time to get into those. It is part of the end time re revelation of the book. But, but, but just a quick synopsis. One of the churches was a lukewarm church. Lord, don't let us be lukewarm. They were passive. They were unmotivated. They were comfortable. They were disinterested. They were disjointed and disconnected. They were occupied with other things. Their arms were folded and almost like daring the Holy Spirit to move them. They were the lukewarm church. And Jesus says, I'd rather you be hot or cold than lukewarm. Get in or out. And one of the churches had lost their first love, the Ephesian church. They were no longer intimately in love with Jesus. And, and if you're not in love with Jesus, the very motivation necessary to obey him is not there. So he said, return to your first love and get it right. One church had allowed some woman calling herself a prophetess to operate in the church and lead people astray with false teachings, usurping the pastoral leadership. Another church was tolerant of false doctrines. Somehow thought that in the name of tolerance, in the name of increasing the crowds, in the name of harmony, that false teaching and bad doctrine could live side by side with truth in the church. And one church was just plain dead. One church was just plain dead. Now sometimes we think a dead church is a church that People don't shout or people don't worship or people don't have good lively music or, or, or they don't get with it. That's our idea sometimes of a dead church. But, but this is what Jesus says. He goes, look, you look like you're prospering. Everything looks good on the surface. You have plenty of money. You have state-of-the-art technology. By all appearances, you are, you're, you're, you're rolling it with it. They had professional musicians, color-coordinated code mass choir. But inside, they were spiritually dead. And Jesus warns these churches, look, fix what is wrong. Strengthen what is right. We often quote in Revelations where Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. 
If any man hear me and open up and invite me in, I will come in and dine with him. He didn't say that to the sinner. We quote that to the unsaved. He was saying it to the church. He was on the outside knocking, trying to get in. Y'all hearing me today? That church was not ready for his return. I want Jesus to be here from the moment we walk in to the moment we leave. He be the central figure of our song, the central figure of our worship, the central hearer of our prayer, the, sim the, the, the central uh, originator of our joy. Let him be the one who sits as the rightful head of the body of Christ. Let him be the high priest in the room. Let his name be above every other name. Let him be the preeminent one. God never has never become a church where Jesus is not. Not only we are friendly to him. Not only is he welcome. But we are submitted to him. He is the chief Lord and Savior and Master. And we declare it openly on the shame that we serve him. Jesus, you are welcome here. I want him on the outside knocking. We can't be ready in that scenario. Jesus warns them, fix what is wrong. Strengthen what is right. And, and this is what he reminds them. He says, look, it's possible. If you don't do things right, that your candlestick is removed from the throne room. Whoa. No local congregation is indispensable. It's possible for your candlestick to be removed from my presence. The local congregation no longer recognized. He even says to the individual, it's possible if you don't continue in the faith and be faithful to the end for your name to be blotted out of the book of life, no longer in the faith. Y'all hearing me this morning, church? Church, what am I saying? We believe Jesus is coming back. We got to understand that the local congregation matters and the pastor of each of the local congregations matter. And when we disregard either, we will never be missional. We will dis when we disregard either, we will be distracted from our mission. And our mission as a local congregation is to be fruitful, reproduce and add to the kingdom of God. And we fulfill this mission. We continue the business of this mission. We are strategic and focused on this mission until he comes back. Y'all with me still? Can I be specific for City Mission? Here's your pastor talking to the congregation. Here, here at City Mission, here's some, some things. There's a lot more to it. But, but I want you to write this down because I want you to, to, to be on board with this. But, but our mission here. Uh, our number one mission comes from Matthew 28 and 19, where Jesus gives us his mandate before ascending up to the throne. He says, go, therefore, and make disciples. Everyone say disciples. Go make disciples of all nations. Making disciples is, must be, and is the chief mission of City Mission. It must be what we embrace. It's got to be our heart cry. It's got to be our passion. It's got to be our yes and amen to the mandate. We have to take it seriously that this is what Jesus said I'm looking for out of you. In fact, if I had to really break it down, when Jesus left, gives us the parable of the master leaving and handing his servants 10 minas here's the 10 minas he says go I'm about to go away but I'm saying go therefore all authority is given unto me in heaven and earth therefore go in the name of my name and authority and you go make disciples of all nations and these signs are going to follow you in my name my authority you're going to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover you're going to cast out devils you're going to speak in tongues you're going to touch deadly stuff it's not going to harm you because you have a mission and I'm going to work with you in this mission and I'm going to send you a helper who is the Holy Ghost to help you do this mission it is the mandate it's got to be our mandate it's not something the pastor's saying, it's something Jesus said. And I'm saying we've got to get on board. 
And that's why I have this drive to teach and equip. It's what I love most. And that's why Wednesday nights is so exciting to me. And we, we if you don't know, on Wednesdays at right now, 1800, we're about to switch it. But we, we meet uh, for Bible study and we break the word open line by line. And we're, it took us three weeks to get through John chapter 1. But we're in John chapter 2 starting this Wednesday because uh, uh, we've got to teach the word. But, but it's got to be bigger than that. That's just a start here at City Mission. It's got to be integrated in every arena and aspect of the church. Our kids need to be discipled, learning sound doctrine. When ladies come together, they need to be learning sound doctrine and teaching. When men come together, we need to be learning sound doctrine and teaching. When, when youth come together, they need to be learning sound doctrine and teaching across the board. We need to become a di discipling church. Make disciples. And we need to be missional. And it's twofold for me. The first part of that mission is going unto the least. And I'm thankful. And that's found in Matthew 25. One of my favorite uh, philosophies for my ministry I believe in. Is that we go to the least. That means we clothe the naked. House the homeless. Feed the hungry. Visit the sick and prisoner. That, that's, that's a mandate here. And, and by the way this is an end time uh, pr uh, prophecy or a prophetic word in Matthew 25. And this is what he's looking for when he calls us together under the great white throne judgment. Those who went and did this. It's got to be our mission. I'm I'm thankful when I arrived already this was integrated in city mission and, and going to the least and feeding the hungry even our missionaries that we are sponsoring in Romania they're building houses they're they're clothing people they're doing great things and we support them so by supporting them we are fulfilling the mission if you don't already give the missions I'm throwing in a plug we support a ministry in Romania doing great things but listen it's who we are but I'm going to throw this at you that we're, we need to get better at doing. And maybe we need to start doing some teaching on it. And that is our second mission, but not, not in rank, but just in addition, is that we go into the lost. Y'all yeah, yeah. hearing me this morning? Jesus gave another parable in which the master of the wedding says this. You go into the highways, go into the hedges, wherever you need to go, and compel them in. Why? Because I want my house filled. Woo. Y'all with me, guys. And we're about to find out about this in, in, in September. As we do a teaching series and activation of prayer to a new level. But Jesus said this. It's written. My house shall be called a house prayer. Matthew 21, 13. We want to get to the point where everyone associates city mission with a house prayer. I know we can pray anywhere. I can drive down the road and pray. It's one of my favorite times to pray if I'm by myself. Uh, when I was back home and I would mow the grass on my riding mower, I love that time of prayer because I couldn't hear anybody and I'd drown out all the noise and just mow and, and pray. Uh, we can pray all kinds of places and I hope that you pray throughout the day a whispered prayer here and there. But there's something about God's house becoming a place of prayer. When you gather together as the church, where it's where you have your moments of victory. It's places where you've wrestled and came up blessed. It's places where you've fought and came out victorious. There, in fact, I'm not going to jump ahead in September, but the Bible's full of moments where men had encounters with God. And the very first thing they did was built an altar on that spot. A place of prayer as a reminder of what God had had done and and every time they went by that altar it was a reminder that is where God changed my destination that is where God changed my name that is where God let me enter into my purpose and destiny that is where God changed my family around that's where God first called me to this call and these altars were places of prayer and I want city mission to be such a praying place that you have moments where you remember that's the spot where we touch God and wouldn't let go of the altar until we heard from heaven. Woo, y'all with me? I'm talking about our mission and purpose. We're going to be teaching about that all in September. And we're going to be activating it and taking it to, to a different lens. Listen, everything we do 
Every ministry we have here at City Mission must chase after that mission. How long? Until Jesus comes back again. How long? Until we hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. We do business until Jesus comes. We handle well what we have. We handle well what he's placed in our care. We handle it with holiness. We handle it with reverence. We handle it with the fruit of the spirit. We handle it with right order and right relationships. We handle it partnered with the Holy Spirit. We handle it with great faith. We present it back to the master and says, Lord, we've increased what you gave us. Everybody shout increase. We, we hand it back to him. I'm going to bring this to a close here in just a second. But, but that's the responsibility of the church. In fact, when Jesus inspects the branches, you read about it in, in the gospel of John. When he inspects the branches, he's looking for fruit production, increase in productivity, and he's not adverse, the husbandman, to cutting off branches that are fruitless, and he does. I don't want to be an unfruitful branch in the kingdom, but listen, he calls the ten servants together. That represents the wholeness of the church, but then each individual, one by one, is called to answer for his or her part. Y'all hearing me this morning? I'm going to leave this in your lap. We as individuals, if we know Jesus is coming back, we need to be doing the business of the kingdom. And there's disciplines to being a disciple. They're, they're simple. We, we connect to the local body, being a member in particular, fitly joined. We sit under a shepherd and gather regularly at the fold at feeding time, which happens to be Sunday morning and Wednesday night now, tithing and giving as a faith act covenant of worship and caring for others in the body by utilizing your gifts of the spirit and ministry gifts to build up each other. These are disciplines of, uh, of an individual in the church, but it's further than that. When you grow as an individual, you're also called to give account to produce, grow, increase, and bear fruit in the local body and in the kingdom of God. Are you a fruit bearer? Are you multiplying? Are you increasing? Are you adding to the kingdom? Lord, help us. There's a helper, he said, who would help you do it. He's called the Holy Spirit. But that's another sermon for another time. You know, let me, I, I really am on my last page and even half a page. But I'm about to close it out here in just a second. I, I've been pastoring long enough and been saved long enough. Some of you may have been saved longer than me. So you've been around church. You've probably seen this too. But I've been in churches and I've seen churches where there were people in the body that drove away people regularly and never added to the kingdom. Am I, am I talking all right this morning? Y'all seen this? They've driven away people regularly. I, I, we had a couple in our home church where I got saved and, and, and they, they were very... Uh, in your face couple, they were a very present couple in the church. They're a very hard couple, very hard line. And they had the gift of the spirit or the gift of rebuke. And they would rebuke easily in anyone that they felt wasn't living right, doing right, dressed right. And, and, and through the years, I observed this couple, how many people they pulled aside. And they corrected harshly only for that person to leave the church. Usually new converts, new people coming into the church who didn't know everything about living right. And, and yet they would pull them aside and you need to be doing that and you shouldn't be doing this. And, and people would leave through the years. It started to bug me. And the more it bugged me, I realized that in all the years I've known them in our home church, home church I've never seen them win someone to the Lord bring somebody to the church, increase the body of Christ, bring another family in. And for, to this day, maybe that may still be the case. And it bothered me. I don't want to be, I made my mind up as a young guy then. I don't want to be that. I don't want to be the one who always drives away, but never brings somebody into the kingdom. Are you hearing me this morning, church? That's got to be a core value. I'm in the business of adding and drawing and bringing and increasing. Lord, help us to do it. Listen, uh, uh, you're called to minister to the least. 
And, and I've, I showed you up here that means ministering to the needs of people without expecting anything in return. Doing it simply because Jesus said, when you do it, it's the same as doing it to me, which me, to me is the highest act of worship possible. In your neighborhood, in your village, in your job, in your complex. Going to the least and meeting the needs of people and be in the hands of Jesus. But you also as individuals are called to reach the lost. You have the responsibility to touch people, to influence, to infiltrate dark places, to do spiritual warfare on behalf of people who are lost and undone. You are given the responsibility to add to the kingdom. And it really becomes your passion. You ask the question, is someone entering heaven because of my witness? Hmm. My wife could come to the piano if she wants. You can even ask your, yourself this question. Have I, in my walk with Christ thus far, added to the kingdom? Do I have something to show? I'm talking to the individual. I want to make sure that if Jesus calls me home in ministry as a pastor, I can say there's a church here, there's a preacher here, there's a servant here that are serving you because I dare to step out of my comfort zone and add them to the kingdom. Now, y'all know Jesus does the adding. Don't get hyper the theological on me. He does the saving and the, he adds them to the kingdom of God. But we are responsible for sowing the seed. That's another sermon parable. We're the responsible ones for going and teaching and preaching. Are you hearing me? Now, let me say something to some of you guys. I may have shared this testimony before. When I was in the Navy, I was on a ship for two years. A small ship, about 300 guys. And for a long time, I was the only Christian on that ship. One Christian on a ship full of sailors. Sailors could be pretty vile. In all ways, life, speech. The one thing I didn't lose is my testimony. I was on fire, Christian, openly Christian, drew my line in the sand on some things, spoke to people when I could, prayed for some when I needed to. I was known and sometimes harassed. When I left my ship, I was really distraught. That in the two years time, I didn't win someone to the Lord. And I would take people to church. In fact, my pastor in Portsmouth, Virginia loved it because I would have a pew full every Sunday of sailors. <laughs> I won other sailors to the Lord, but none on my ship. I said, Lord, what's going on here? Except about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, our secretary at my church called me and said, Pastor, some guy's been trying to reach you. He called the church. He Googled your name, found out you're a pastor in here, and, he, and his name's Vonnie Morgan. I said, yeah, I know Vonnie. He was on my ship. He's been trying to reach you. She gave him my email. So when I got home, I opened my emails, and there was an email from him, and it was this long letter from him, and he says, you know what, Provazic? He goes, I just want you to know that I'm sitting here in this new convert discipleship class here in Florida at the Assembly of God with my wife. I, I gave my heart to the Lord and we both joined the church. Because, But I just was thinking about you and I want you to know, the way years ago back on that ship, when you would talk about the Lord and witness and testify and lived your life and we gave you a hard time and picked on you. He said, sometimes I even resented you. He goes, but I want you to know that the stuff you told me never left. And he started quoting stuff that I'd said I never remembered. He goes, I want you to know it wasn't in vain. 
And that taught me a lesson, Brother Ferdinand, that it doesn't matter if you see somebody saved on the spot. We're called to plant seed. One man plants, another man waters, but God gives the increase. So I'm saying, church, your mission is to get out there and plant seeds and stop looking for, for your own measurable results. I thought that was pretty cool. And then it was not that long afterward, I, I got a, a, another uh, a letter in the mail. This time it was from someone from high school. A young lady who I used to sit next to in class and witness to. Uh, and, and she uh, was gracious but never came to church. I would invite her. And, and I had written something in her yearbook. And, and I don't remember what it was, but she wrote me a letter. Years ago, I'm married with kids. She goes, I want to thank you for being a witness in high school. I went through my yearbook and I read what you wrote. And you encouraged me to accept the Lord into my heart and you left me scriptures. She goes, I just want you to know I'm a minister of the gospel now. And I'm thankful for people who planted seeds and prayed for me long before I even realized that God was going to call me. I said, wow. Hear me, young adults, even in high school, plant seeds. A third time, I get this long email on this person I didn't even know. This is when I was stationed in Naples, and we had a, a Bible study class that we started that eventually turned into a church uh, uh, congregation that we planted. But in this Bible study, there was someone, I didn't know her. And we would witness to her and we'd try to pull her in, obviously. And when she was leaving, I had written her a long letter, something God had given me to give her. I don't know what it was, but again, the same story. She says, I, I'm sitting in my church and I found the letter you wrote to me in my Bible. And as I read it, I was weeping because I went through some tough times. I went through rehabs and drugs and my life fell apart. But God has called me back and I read your letter. And it was as if you wrote it for me today. This is 20-something uh, years later. 20-something years later. What am I saying? You need to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. Start planting seeds. Write somebody a letter. Give somebody a card. Give somebody a scripture. Let the Holy Spirit nudge you to give you a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom to somebody. Because you never know what God is doing under the surface. And how in the fullness of time, God will take that seed you planted and multiply it and add into the kingdom. That's your mission. Stand with me. I, I'm laying this on you because I want you to go replicate this. Big or small. Touch somebody. Care for somebody. Reach for somebody. Make them your mission. Pray for them. Be bold. You don't have to be an evangelist and know how to lead somebody through the Romans road to salvation. You don't have to know how to preach the fullness of the salvation message, but you need to start planting some seeds. Because you're doing it by yourself, you're going to fail, but if you realize you're partnering with the Holy Spirit, He will lead you and guide you, and that's why He's here. He nudges you. Learn to obey that nudge. He gives you a word for people. Learn to share that word. Let's pray. I could preach on this. I, I, I'm getting round up on that alone. Mission. He said, keep doing it. Add, multiply, reproduce until I come back. And if Jesus was to write a letter to City Mission, I want to hear him say, City Mission, just want to say you're doing a good job feeding the homeless and going to the least. You're doing a good job praying and calling out faithfully to me. I want to hear him say, City Mission, you're doing a good job spreading seeds in the harvest field and reaping in the lost into the kingdom. Will he say it to me? Will he say it to you individually? God has placed this in your hands. What are we going to do with it? Bow your heads, please. Father. I know beyond the shadow of a doubt, every word in the Gospels, every word in the epistles, 
Every word Old and New Testament are truth. I believe, Lord, that you're coming back as promised. Your return will be glorious. Your church is triumphant. We, Lord, win. We'll reign and rule with you for all eternity. But even now, we walk as heirs of the kingdom. Even now, we walk anointed and set aside. Ambassadors, ministers of reconciliation. Filled with the Spirit sent by you with power of eternity. To tread on scorpions and serpents. Father, I thank you for it. Forgive us for taking that lightly. Forgive us for not missional at all times. I'm praying, God, that you would mobilize those in this room, those who are watching on live stream and those who are out of town and elsewhere who may watch this later. Upon hearing this, that you would stir their soul and stir their spirit to become missional and purposeful in the kingdom of God. Is God speaking to somebody right now? First of all, if you're not saved and you know after this sermon, that's something you need to do. I invite you to come quickly and, and pray and kneel and I'll, I'll give you guidance. You don't have to do it by yourself. We'll pray with you and lead you and what that means. But, but right now, specifically, someone you're, you're saved, but God's speaking to you right now. And you know you got to say amen and yes, Lord. I want you to come up here. I'm going to pray with you as your pastor. I'm going to pray a covering over you. You say yes to the Lord. I'm going to pray a covering over you. And pray God anoint you to do what God nudging you. If he's calling you the higher purpose. If he's calling you the bigger mission. If he's calling you the mobilize. Say yes and come. Father, in the name of Jesus. Only just a moment. I'm going to linger. But if God's speaking to you. Now's the moment. Father, in the name of Jesus, touch these people, your people, your children, the family of God. Touch their hearts. Y'all know this song? Sing it. We're going to pray in just a second. Something very spe specific. Sing it. Uplifted hands, sing it to him. All to thee, my blessed Savior. Y'all know that song? Sing it one more time. I